John Warner to introduce you somewhere on your bucket list because um, he unites more people and brings more people together than anybody else that I know. And it's, it's extraordinary what he does in terms of communities. Um, I, I want to be respectful of your time and I want to get to uh, the topic. And then what I really want to do is I want to talk about the stuff that you um, so for the last decades and talks with a lot of you who are on here like George and Gary and Mary Lou, and so many of you, uh, Diana, um, the question has been not just the technology, but what does this technology do to ethics? And that was not a question that I could answer in 30 seconds or one minute. And so I started thinking about it and it took me about somewhere between 10 years and six years to write this book. Um, and in the process of doing that, I got more and more upset about what was going on because one of the things that we're living with today is a false equivalent. We're, we're, we're living in a time when there's so many things that are going wrong. There's so many things that instinctually we know are just way off the rails that it's almost like the story of the day dominates what's happening. And in the last 48 hours, we saw this story, which is the White House spokesman coming out and saying, lawyers can't find the parents of 545 children separated under Trump. And telling the kids and the public that the parents don't want the children back. And, and, and so that, to my mind, is a double crime against humanity that should be tried in The Hague. I mean, it's that order of magnitude where you deliberately separate children. You then are asked by the courts to reunite them with the parents and you tell the children that the parents don't want them. And, and that's a level of cruelty that is incomprehensible. And in terms of history of the United States and history of the world, this is going to be a big deal. But somehow because of this era of false equivalence and outrage and everything else, that gets overwhelmed during the same cycle by a hashtag Tuban. And, you know, what Tuban did was stupid. I suspect it was a massive accident, incredibly stupid accident, but this is just not morally equivalent. And, and yet somehow we're in a period where when we talk about ethics and we talk about right and wrong, one story is a smaller story than the other one. So how did we get here? Well, let me go through a series of stages as to how you get in a situation where ethics becomes this black and white and you have to pick one side or the other. And it goes back to how technology changes the nature of warfare or how it changes the nature of conflict. And so this machine, the machine gun, fundamentally changed how we fight each other. And it did so in World War I. And in essence, what it did is it created a trench over here and a trench over here. And you were either in the French trench or you were in the German trench. And there was just no in between, right? There's a reason why that was called no man's land. And if you tried to occupy the center or if you tried to occupy any space but the trench, they killed you. And by the way, if you tried to leave the trench and retreat from the trench, then your own side killed you. And in a very strange way, we have now entered in terms of how we deal with each other, what we consider right and wrong, the same type of a trench warfare. So you're either 100% on this side or you're 100% on this side with the exception of some very brave people. But in essence, you're shooting tweets and you're shooting Facebook and you're shooting television ads and you're shooting this, that, and the other at those on the other side and everybody on the other side is a deplorable or a pedophile. And it's just this, this incredibly entrenched, no movement, no center fight between people. And a lot of people are doing things or saying things that are gonna be completely indefensible 10 years, 20 years, 30 years forward. And 
it's, it's partly driven by this logic of trench warfare. Because when you convince yourself that you know right from wrong, and you know the, tru the truth, right? And you are a defender of the truth, then there's no discussion, there's no tolerance, there's no evolution, there's no learning, and there's no humor, right? We, we, we become so obsessed by our rightness that we quit listening. And this leads to even some awkward questions like, you know, sometimes you actually fear those in your own trench. And, and those in your own trench are sometimes shooting at you. And that's a very complicated situation because it creates a certainty that I'm right and we are right. And when you have that certainty, if someone inside your trench even marginally varies from what you think is 100% right, then you try and cancel that person even though that person is in your trench. So it becomes very hard to have a campus debate against somebody who fundamentally disagrees with you. But it sometimes becomes hard to have a campus debate with somebody who agrees with you on 95% of the stuff, but not on 5% of the stuff. And it becomes incredibly dangerous to have discussions to say, maybe you're not 100% right. And it creates this insecurity of what if I say something wrong? And people are burned all the time. Careers go up in flames. Even if they've done the right thing for the last 20 years, even if they said the right thing for the last 20 years, but that career can be burned because a photograph appears of you having dinner next to someone that later becomes famous or because, or infamous, not famous, or because you wore the wrong costume 10 years ago or 20 years ago, which in today's context is absolutely verboten. Or because you use words 100 years ago, like Mark Twain did, that today have a connotation that is hideous. And so what's really odd about the system where I'm right and you're wrong, and you're either with me and you're right, or you're not with me, you're wrong, creates this incredibly dangerous system where ideas can't be discussed. You can't meet people in the middle. You've created a no man's land and God help you if you're an academic or a CEO or a university administrator or just somebody who posts the wrong opinion on Twitter and your tribe disagrees. And it can take one tweet for you to be ostracized one photograph for you to be ostracized. So when you ask people, so what side are you on, right? As you drive through, you know, yard after yard in Maine, you see one of these two signs. It's either Black Lives Matter or we support the police. And you very rarely see those signs together where someone can supply it support black lives and say, we also support law enforcement. And the weird thing is that when you ask in June about support for Black Lives Matter, 67% of people supply, support Black Lives Matter and 60 some odd percent of people support law enforcement. Now, are there people in law enforcement that have done absolutely hideous things? Has there been excesses in law enforcement? Absolutely no question. But look, I grew up in a country where the police doesn't work and where the police really are the bad guys. And I have some idea of what happens when the police truly doesn't work or what happens in places where you don't have law enforcement. So coming back to this false equivalence, are there necessary reforms? Absolutely. Do you have to pick a side? And if you dare say, maybe we should consider what both sides need, not that both sides are equivalent, not that both sides have suffered equally, not that the power structure is equal for both sides. I'm not arguing that, but, but I am arguing that this trench warfare where you're either in this trench or that trench 
is a very dangerous thing. It's not where America wants to be because that's how you rip nations apart. And, and this is fascinating to me. So this is um, from yesterday. And what the two candidates for governor of Utah did is they did a joint political ad. And they basically said, you know, I hope you vote for me. And the other one said, I hope you vote for me. But you know what? One of us is gonna be the governor of the state and we're in favor of the state and whatever happens, we're both gonna support each other because this state matters and America matters. And this thing got 2.8 million views in 24 hours because that's where people's heads are at. That's what people want. They, they, they don't want a no man's land where it's 100% everybody on the other side is evil and has to be shot at. And you have to be 100% pure and you can never make a mistake in something you say in class. You can never make a mistake in something you said five years ago. We will throw stuff in your face because your spouse says something and then we will spit in your face like happened to Nicholas Christakis, which was one of the incentives for me to finally write this book. Because that is just not the way we should be treating each other. And, and what this does is it rips nations to pieces. It eliminates a middle ground. And the reason why this is so dangerous is, let, let's assume for a second that you are Mother Teresa. Okay, so you are a saint. So you are the one in a million, and you in particular happen to be right on 99% of things. So let's even grant you as a thought experiment, you are right, you are pure, you are good. Okay, but what happens if right and wrong changes over time? And what happens if you're gonna be judged in retrospect? Because when you say I am right and you are wrong and I am certain that I am right and you take that position and you quit listening, then it's very hard for you to evolve. And the problem with right and wrong is what's okay today may be wrong tomorrow. And so you see that happen time and again, right? I mean, there was a long period of time where if you did not sacrifice people and rip their living hearts out, the sun wouldn't rise. And of course, that was the right thing to do because you were placating the gods. And without that, there would be no sun. But that turned out to be pretty wrong. There was a long period of time, and there are still places where public executions are considered not just judicial events, not just punishment events, but entertainment for the crowds. And people sell postcards, and people sell food, and people go and take their kids to enjoy the execution in the public square. And of course, I think everybody on this call would say, God, that is just so profoundly wrong. But at the time it was considered right and just. This is very personal to me because I grew up going to this church every day in grammar school. And I listened to the mass in Latin and what the preacher and the teacher and my parents and my peers and the laws and everybody else told me is being gay is wrong. So the epithets that we had, you know, and what we called people and God help you if you were a feminine on that playground. Because not only were we very cruel, but there was an incentive by the priests and the teachers to be cruel. And so you take a guy who thinks about morals all day long, and, and you can argue, you know, this guy is, you know, too conservative, too liberal. I agree with him on this. I don't agree with him on this. I like this. I don't like that. Okay, fair enough. What's very hard to argue with is this is a person who spends a lot of time thinking about what's right and what's wrong. And so what's fascinating in this particular instance is that when he was asked about marriage equality, his comment as Cardinal in 2010 is this is a destructive attempt towards God's plan. Three years later, as Pope, he comes out and says, if someone is gay and is searching for the Lord and has goodwill, who am I to judge? A almost 180% flip on a position in three years on what 
he considers a fundamental moral issue and his flock considers a fundamental moral issue. So if he can be so right or so wrong, depending on what you believe and flip 180 degrees in three years. And if society can do this, because society in 1997 was 68% against gay marriage, and that flipped pretty quickly to 64% against. Then you have to think about A, right and wrong can flip. Our notion of what's right and what's wrong can flip. And when we judge somebody for holding a position, which was the majority position in 1997, we may want to take into account how were they brought up? Who were they taught by? What were the laws of the time? What was the prevailing structure? And be a little more gentle when we judge those people from today's viewpoint. Because this stuff is continuing to change. Yesterday, it turns out that Pope Francis comes out and says he's supporting same-sex civil unions, which is going to drive a lot of his flock absolutely crazy. And, you know, this is a flock that I understand because I was brought up with a lot of those folks. And if I had not come to the States, if I had not been exposed to Ben Schatz at Harvard, who was spectacular in making his, you know, Latin bigot understand just how important it is to treat people in a different way. I could have ended up being continuing to be a bigot as I was brought up to be when I was in grammar school. So, you know, you really have to understand where did people grow up? What did they grow up with? And you really have to understand people can change. People can be educated. But you, you, you can't do that by attacking people, by destroying people, by accusing people. And you do have to separate out the people who are fundamentally evil. That you do have to do. Because if you make everybody equivalent, then it's very hard to isolate those who are committing crimes against humanity. The traditional view of ethical evolution is that religion and philosophy and morals work in concert and against each other and debate each other. And that's how you get changes in ethics. But I think that's been changing. And I think the primary driver of technology increasingly has been, I'm sorry, of ethics has been technology. And, you know, this has been true for a while. New technologies often kill old religions. So you get a new technology, you know, whether it be riding horses and having bows that you can shoot off the horses that are galloping or guns or whatever else, but new technologies come in and tend to wipe out the old religions, often behind guns. And the implication of that is that technology really impacts ethics in a fundamental way and impacts religions in a fundamental way. And if you want a more peaceful example of this, there's a whole lot of explanations as to why Islam spreads so fast. And part of it was the corruption of the Byzantine Empire. Part of it was the centralization of armies and good leadership in those armies in the Islamic world. Part of it was certainly new weaponry. But there was another fundamental driver at the grassroots level, which is that Islam began to spread on a massive basis after the Justinian plague, which wiped out 20% or 30% of the population in some places. And so here you have this new religion that's spreading quickly and people are praying pretty fervently at that point for God to protect them against the plague. And let's just think about two flocks. So here's a flock over here that is maybe getting bathed once or twice a year because that was not a part of religious ritual. And here's a flock over here that is told, you must wash your hands, wash your face, wash your feet five times a day. So practice basic hygiene. Well, guess what happened? 
in terms of who God would protect against the plague on average. And, and you see that play out in other places, right? I mean, there, there's a commonality in some of the prohibitions against food in the Middle East between Judaism and, Islam, and Islam. And so, again, let's try this experiment. So here's a population that likes pigs, eats pigs, lives with pigs, often in the same house. And here's a population that says pigs are dirty, never go near them, don't eat them. God protect us from X, Y, or Z. Okay, well, during a time when the swine flu was loose and when trichinosis was loose, guess whose flock on average got protected? So as you think about new technologies, often ethics are driven by new technologies. And as new technologies come in, you have the ability to do things for good and for ill that change the ethics of what you do and how you do things. So let's talk about indentured servitude, about serfs, about slaves. This is something that's been around for millennia. And it was a phenomenon that occurred in a horrendous, heart-wrenching, brutal way in the US South. And, and the Americans were crueler than almost any civilization because it was hereditary slavery. And the slaves were treated in very different ways than they were in a lot of other places. And I, that is a horrendous truth that we have to face and live with. But it is also true that the US South was not the only place that had slaves. The Incas, the Mayas, the Africans, the Greeks, the Romans, the Chinese, everybody had slaves. Almost every civilization went through this process of enslaving the others. And so then the question is, so why did this thing go away after millennia? And one option is the first part of ethics, that first three circles, which is a series of smart, educated, human, enlightened people in religion, in education, in philosophy said, stop it. And after millennia, people listen. And that is certainly a part of the story. There's a second part of the story that has to do with power. And, and that's perhaps a complementary story. So for millennia, there were very, very few ways of augmenting the power of a human being. One of the ways you could do it is to have a horse. And that was the equivalent of bringing in four people to eight people per horse, depending on how big they were. What happened during that period is because you couldn't augment human power, what you had to do to become rich is you had to enslave more people because there was not more productivity per person since the year zero through the year 1850, right? Flat world GDP per person. That begins to change when you can concentrate power. Because in the ancient world, let's say that you wanted to get from um, New York to California. Remember those old Viking ships where they would manacle poor schlubs to the oars and then beat the drum and they'd have to beat the drum? Well, to get somebody in terms of power from New York to California in six hours, it would require the equivalent of 320,000 people rowing you across the country. Just that's the power you had to concentrate. And of course, that still wouldn't have gotten you across in eight hours. Why does this change? How does it change? When do you start to see a global movement against serfdom, against indentured servitude, against slavery? And I'm not saying we've dealt with all these problems. I'm not saying we have eliminated all these problems. And above all, I'm not saying in any way, shape or form that slavery was justified. But I am asking, why did this transition occur when it occurred? And part of it came because all of a sudden, when you start using oil, each barrel of oil contains 10 years of human labor. And when you tie that to thousands of horsepower, then all of a sudden you have the ability to do an enormous amount of work without having to enslave thousands of people. 
And so one jet engine is the equivalent of 160,000 people and two jet engines is the equivalent of those 320,000 people rowing across the United States. That's the kind of power you're concentrating in this thing. And in this case, technology was an enormous benefit to average human lifespan. Because you could treat better, people better. You didn't have to enslave people. You could give them more and treat them better. And so what happened? So life expectancy in the world, which had been flat for centuries, all of a sudden explodes across continents. And wealth explodes. So all of a sudden you have just tremendous amount of wealth and you can afford to be more generous. So here's where it gets interesting. If you assume that technology changes ethics, if you assume that can happen relatively quickly, if technology is exponential and technology changes ethics, then ethics might begin to change at an exponential rate. And if that's true, then this notion of I am right may end up being very wrong tomorrow. So even if you're right today, when you're judged in 100 years, it may turn out to be a different story. Take a picture that looks like this. So this is an album cover. And you know there's all kinds of reasons why people might be upset by this picture. What's the nun doing in the window? Why is the trailer park depicted like this? Why are they living in poverty? Why are they scantily cl clad? But probably at this point, not many of you have focused on the barbecue. And yet that may be the most controversial thing in this picture in 50 or 100 years. Because as meat gets faster, better, cheaper, synthetic meat, as a synthetic hamburger goes from $230,000 in 2013 to 30 bucks in 2015 to nine bucks today at Whole Foods, then you can have cruelty-free beef. Then you don't have to slaughter 6 billion animals in a year, and then you have an option. And so in retrospect, a picture like this looked at in 50 years, where mom and dad or grandpa and grandma went to the fanciest steakhouse in town. And they were so savage back then that they'd have rotting meat in the entrance and they thought that was a luxury. This picture is going to look very different when synthetic meat is available. In reproduction, right? The first patent for a synthetic uterus way back in 1955. So it doesn't have an impact, doesn't have an impact, doesn't have an impact, but in Nature Magazine, you start to publish pictures of taking use to term inside a plastic bag. And I think for many of us, there's a yuck factor in this and people are saying, ah, I don't like that. And if you put a human being inside that picture, then it would really increase the yuck factor substantially. And a lot of us would say, oh my God, why would you ever want to do that? But again, fast forward this another 30 years or 50 years. And then the questions might be very different. The question might be at this stage, do you realize my mother was so savage that when she went mountain biking, she would carry me inside her body and expose me to falls instead of keeping me in a nice safe space? Or do you know that my mother took me out hiking during the fires and exposed me to all that smoke instead of leaving me in a HEPA filtered environment? And of course, once you have an external fetus, then intervention in that fetus becomes a lot easier. And of course, as intervention becomes easier, faster, better, cheaper, the notion of what's right and what's wrong might fundamentally change. Because right now, there are justified complex debates of are we using CRISPR in the right way? Should we be editing children? For what things? Only for deadly conditions. Any other things. But that logic might flip 180 degrees in 
a generation or two where you, you could easily see a conversation in whatever the equivalent of a coffee is saying, do you realize my grandparents were so savage they didn't take out the cancer causing genes? They didn't edit out KRAS, they didn't edit out P53, they didn't edit out BRCA1 because they were so superstitious they thought you shouldn't edit. And it'll be a logic flipped 180 degrees. So these scandals, and again, I'm not justifying the way this experiment was carried out. I'm not saying this was the right time, the right place, the right structure of safety to carry out editing of babies in China. But I am saying that this particular topic might look very different as things become faster, better, cheaper, and are more accepted. And not doing this might be the wrong thing to do for a majority of people. So what's my call to action in this? Because technology changes ethics, we have to start using words that we are not using in today's polarized discourse. Because we are so certain in our trench or because people are so certain in the other trench, we've, we've put aside words and we're just not using words like humility and forgiveness. When we judge people in the past and say, they did X, they did Y, they did Z, look, there were people who in the context of their time were absolutely horrendous human beings and should be judged for being horrendous human beings. And there were people who in the context of their time were following the norms of right and wrong as they understood them. And I wanna make absolutely certain to underline that does not make what they were doing right. They were not doing the right things but in the context of their time, that's the way they were brought up, that's the way they were educated, and they should be judged with a little bit more forgiveness than people who do the same things today. Taking a child, disappearing it from their parents is a really serious crime today because we understand that. And the Argentine generals and the Brazilian generals were sent to jail for doing that in the 1960s and 70s. It took a while, but they went to jail. And these guys should go to jail. So there should not be humility and forgiveness vis-a-vis -vis those acts today. But there should be some humility in how we judge each other if the intention is not murderous or destructive towards others, if it's a mistake, if it's a concept of right that may differ from ours that hopefully as the Pope did, as the church is doing, evolves. Even you might not know right from wrong always. And when you judge your ancestors, you better hope that they're not judged as harshly as some of us are judging the past today. And again, I'm not trying to justify anything that occurred. I'm not trying to say it was right. I'm trying to put a context in the judgment towards the past because we're going to be judged and we're going to be judged pretty spectacularly because the record that we have left of who we are, what we think, what we consider right and what we consider wrong is so extreme that no figure in past history has ever been electronically tattooed as we have. We know more about everybody's life and we will know more about everybody's life than in any generation in history, even if you were a king, or even if you were the most famous person during the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, it doesn't matter. Pick a person today, you're gonna to know more about them. I'll give you an example. 8th of December in Norway every year. You can click on the little blue thing here and know exactly what that person made that year and exactly how much they paid in taxes. It's not that the president doesn't release his taxes. It's that every single citizen of that country is absolutely transparent in terms of their taxes. Now, there is one small caveat. If you click on that little blue thing and you put in somebody's name, that person gets notified that you are looking. So it creates an interesting incentive and counter incentive. 
would happen in the United States if some hacker got into the IRS and made absolutely everybody's income transparent overnight? It, it's just an interesting thought process to think what would be right, what would be wrong, what would we consider okay, what would we not consider okay if this was made transparent overnight for every single person who files a tax return in the United States. And in a strange way, that is part of the debate as to what's right and what's wrong about capitalism. And should capitalism have permission to operate and under what circumstances? Because on the extremes, in one trench, it's capitalism no matter what. And in the other one, it's cancel capitalism. And, and I think most people are somewhere in this middle ground that's very difficult to hold. And the reason why there's, there's a debate around this, and the reason why the ethics of this are so interesting these days is because economics used to be a question of how do you allocate scarcity? And for almost all things today, we have enough calories to feed everybody in the world. We have enough machinery to make all the pens. We have enough machinery to make all the phones. We have enough machinery to make all the medicines. We have all the machinery to make all the beds, all the bed nets, all the penicillin. And it becomes an issue of distribution at that stage. It's an issue of if you have more than enough, how do you allocate it? Who has a right to this? And that's a very different question from we don't have enough. It's an especially important question during a period where the likelihood that you're gonna earn more than your parents did has dropped from 90% of the baby boomer generation to less than 50% today. So the number of people who have a stake in defending the current system as structured today is dropping. It's a system where 1% owns 48% of the dollars. And then you can ask yourself the question, okay, maybe it's fine because they're smarter, because they work really hard, because they had a brilliant idea, because they were in the right place at the right time, whatever reason you want. Maybe you think, okay, it's fine if 1% owns 48%. Okay, how about 55%? How about 65%? How about 75%? And this is a relevant question because this divergence is increasing. So the trend line is if you're at the bottom, you're getting a lot less of this. And if you're at the top, you're getting a lot more of this. And again, that's why you're getting some of these systems questioned. And that's why you're starting to see homelessness. And you're gonna see a lot of homelessness if the stimulus package doesn't go through. Where it's the middle class taking their camping tents and going out on the street and putting Christmas trees for their kids next to the tent on the sidewalk. This is not the traditional homelessness. This is a different structure of homelessness being caused by this stuff. You're beginning to see cartoons like this. Is it your money or is it your life if you can't pay for the medicine? And again, there's good reason why you have to reward those who are making medicines because otherwise they don't get made. But how much and where? And how do you distribute to those who don't have enough? And you can take an extreme position of don't put any constraints whatsoever on this. Or you can take the position, don't charge for this. And those are the two trenches a lot of people are in today. And, and that's not how this gets solved. That's not how you're gonna be able to iterate, continue research and innovation but it's also not the way that you're gonna get personalized treatments for cancer because you've got to start putting this on faster, better, cheaper. And when it does become faster, better, cheaper, then people are gonna look back at what you charge and they're gonna judge it in a pretty harsh way. So pick a completely non-controversial topic. We talked about taxes and tax transparency. What happens if you ever got porn transparency? just for yucks. I mean, I know there's a rumor out there that some people look at Pornhub or YouPorn, but I'm not sure if everybody understands the extent of this. So it turns out that there's about 
207,405 videos watched on average on Pornhub during 2018, every minute. And it turns out that this and other sites have downloaded about 283,000 photographs for every person on earth. So this is not a small niche isolated occurrence. And there are enormous databases on this stuff by country, by region, by person. What would happen if all that became transparent? What would happen if somebody came in and made it, as Norway has made tax returns, very clear what every single person is interested in? Or are they interested? What would that do to our discussions, our thoughts about each other, our thoughts about what is normal, what is not normal. This may occur sometime in the next 10 years. So I think we have to think about what we're doing today. We have to think about what we're doing today that may be considered unethical tomorrow. We have to create safe spaces for people to disagree. And we have to be a little less instant or automatic about condemning those who disagree. And that is why it's so important to open up safe spaces on campuses to have discussions. That's why it's so important to be able to have a discussion in business without thinking, oh my God, if I say the wrong thing, if I use the wrong pronoun, if I use the wrong word or insult somebody, I may be canceled. This, this is not a way to bring people along. This is not a way to advance ideas. This is not a way of helping advance ethics. And again, I want to stress, you have to isolate the evil. There are evil people out there, but don't conflate people who are truly doing things against humanity with people who are doing stupid things, with people who disagree with you, with people who had a different education from you, don't create two trenches and make it impossible for somebody to leave that trench and occupy a middle ground. So please get a group of friends together. Please ask each other what's really right and wrong. And understand that technology may even change your certainty about what's right. Let's put a little bit more humility and forgiveness into the system. And let's go after the truly evil people with pickaxes. Let's not let them swing among, swim among us and say everybody's the same. Because that's a recipe for a division and that's a recipe for tearing countries apart. So Juan, thank you. Can you, um, yeah, put gallery mode. So now I'd love to have people ask questions and let me let you know how this will work. Just uh, if, if you wanna ask a question, just chat me and I'll open your mic. Um, and we're gonna do a bunch of questions um, and then Juan will come back with a, a concluding thought. I, I'm just looking at who's on. Uh, I count 11 different countries. So we have a lot of different time zones. Uh, I see um, uh, Robin Chase, the founder of Zipcar is here. Catherine Moore, one of the founders of Robot Surgery. Uh, Richard Saul Worman, who founded TED, the Laters, who founded um, Renaissance Weekend, Sandy Pentland, one of the top data scientists, Sandy Edgerly, one of the uh, top three owners of the Celtics, um, Kim, who founded Java, Janet, who's an amazing artist, Poppy Crum, who is a chief data scientist for Dolby, uh, um, uh, Cam Carey, who was Secretary of Commerce for Obama for a few months, uh, Kate, who's a big environmentalist, a six-time Paralympian, the CEO of Forbes, Mike Federley, uh, Patty Mays, and she said she's so excited that you wrote this book, Juan. Uh, and Cyrus, who is one of the uh, leaders of Innovators for Biden. All right, so if you have a question, just let me know and I'm gonna uh, open it up. Just open up your mic in the chat. So uh, you, know, I'm, you know what, I'm gonna do this a different way. I'm gonna open up the mics to everyone. Uh, can I ask something? 
please. Juan, after writing this book and all the research that you've done, what has changed for you personally in how you live your life, how you invest? Has your mind been changed about anything? So there were a lot of conversations as I, I went along this. Um, um, you know, some of them were with some of the great minds of the world, like yours and George Church, and you know, so many of you who taught me so much. Um, Patty, um, Sandy. There were just a lot of people at MIT that when I started to understand what was going on at Harvard Medical School, what was going on at MIT, what was going on at the Bees Institute, I thought, all right, so we, we really have to understand how this is gonna change the world, not just in terms of technology, but in terms of how generous we can be. And I started to see technology primarily as a force for allowing us to be more generous because we have more and as a greater responsibility for having more and having to be more generous. So I became less afraid of technology. Um, it also clarified for me why so many people have a fundamentally different view. And, and so when I drive through rural Maine or talk to lobster folks in Maine, where I wrote this book, my neighbor's lobster and the other one's a oyster farmer or the other one's a construction uh, worker. Um, you know, they had such a different view of the debate than I did. So, you know, the, one of their views is we sent more soldiers, more Union soldiers than any other state. And, and we're being told that we're too old and too white and we owe. And, and it's, it's a very jarring piece and there's no middle ground for them. So it, it's very frustrating to see it because it's ripping the society apart. So, so you, thank you, Diana. Um, I unmuted all of you. So who wants to go next and ask a question? Please, um, go. Yeah, basically for me, I see technology being weaponized for psychological warfare, specifically fourth generation warfare to drive conflict, to infiltrate groups yeah. and such. We're seeing this with QAnon in a big way. So I wondered if you would have any thoughts about that. Well, again, it's it becomes, and, and again, please don't Look, I, I didn't write this book as a catechism. I don't have the answers, right? I, I'm not, you're not gonna reach the last chapter and it's gonna say, here are Juan's 10 rules for how you're right and more ethical. The reason why I wrote this book is to have discussions exactly with a group that looks exactly like this. Mm. Because we have to find answers to how we don't cancel Twitter, how we don't cancel free speech, how we don't cancel disagreements, and at the same time protect each other from the edge cases of predators. <clears throat> because there are predators in the system. And, and, what, and what we're doing is we're providing a camouflage for the predators in the way we're structuring this debate. So instead of taking out the QAnons early, we, we create a false equivalence in this stuff. And, and, and that's why ethics, which is often considered one of the most boring subjects in the world, it's in the HR manual, you already know it. No, you don't know it. It changes, it shifts, it moves across time. Be a little goddamn more humble when you go and you yell at somebody and tell people they're absolutely wrong because that often changes, right? And, and it, it's just so frustrating to watch people who I so care about get destroyed for something they say. Great. Juan, thanks. Let's get another question. Who's up? Yeah, I've, I've got a question having to do just with time frames. I got to work with Alan Kay many years ago, and he had this great line about technology simply is anything invented after you were born, right? And as we think about sort of the pace of things and sort of those formative years as we grow up and sort of imprint our sense of what right and wrong is do you think we 
as a society, as certainly as enlightened individuals, we, we can overcome it. But as, as, a, as a society, do you think it's possible for us to overcome things that were burned into our brains and in our, in our teens and early adulthood um, later in life and reassess, or is it sort of imprinted? So I can tell you in my particular case, I was brought up to be a bigot against gays in my Jesuit school, in my macho Mexico. And in my case, yes, I learned and I am not the fastest learner. And if the Pope can learn, if I can learn, <laughs> if so many of us as a society can learn, I mean, you look at attitudes towards gay marriage in US society, you look at attitudes towards birth control, you look at attitudes towards IVF, you look at attitudes towards BLM. Yep, coming. They're all coming. Right, and, and we learn, and you, you have to trust your society to be able to have tough discussions and to disagree and then to move. It, it won't happen instantly, but 95% of the people are, are decent people. Thank you, and Corey, you should get your accordion ready after the final, I want you to play something for everyone. Uh, the Michael Jordan <laughs> accordion. All right, who's next? Um, I don't need an accordion, I got a question. Go. So I picked up the book and was expecting it to be inspirational as everything else I've read and heard of you was. And I found it terrifying in ways I wasn't expecting. Yeah. And, and the reason I found it terrifying is because the one thing that I took away from it is technology is going faster and faster and our ability to evolve is stuck in some old model. And, and maybe it's the time of year we're in or the moment in history but I'm going to ask you a question that I'm afraid I know the answer to, uh, but I it's been eating at me, so I have to ask. Um, is there not a role for you in some form of government, given your family history and your history, where you could take these ideas and actually shift the conversation at the federal level into some of these hard questions? I don't know if it's a discussion that we can drive primarily from government today. I, I think if you're going to drive it from government, you have to drive it at the state level. I, I think Charlie Baker has taken a very brave position vis-a-vis um, -vis voting. I haven't seen that position taken by many other people in elected offices. I've seen them take it after they have elected offices. I've seen the Lincoln Project move in directions which are very positive. This Utah ad gives me great hope. I am terrified that somebody who is really smart like Tom Cotton is gonna take this politics of division and do it in a way which truly drives a wedge into society in a far more intelligent, devious Machiavellian way. And, and to fight that, we have to talk about decency and we have to talk about what the hell is America and what the hell is the society. And, and, and to do that, you have to welcome people into your homes and into your conversations that you may profoundly disagree with. And that's very hard to do today because we're so angry and we're so frustrated. But, but we have to restitch this stuff. And I think it's civil society. I, I see it in government at a local level. It's going to be very hard to drive this conversation top down. I, I think it's more creating an awareness of this stuff. And it's all of you in each of your trenches defending that middle ground that's really hard to defend. Because if you, if you speak for middle ground on campus today as a professor or as a dean, or if you try and do it in a business, you'll be crucified. So Juan, if I want to get watch, a bunch more questions in. Uh, if you could be a little... Uh, Shorter, these are digital yeah. tattoos, as you know. Uh, Daniela Roos, you run um, the Schwartzman College of Computing, the new initiative. Love to see if you have any uh, questions here. Uh, Daniela, if you want to jump in now or wait. But, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, um, uh, Juan, we, I've been thinking a lot about AI and democracy. Does AI enable or hinder uh, democracy? And especially um, as, we, as we look at this information, and you know, I grew up in a in a country that was um, defined by disinformation, and so I have great sensitivity uh, to this topic. I also have great sensitivity to uh, watching our students and watching 
how the advent of uh, social media uh, is eradicating uh, the ability to engage in polemic, it's eradicating the ability to have um, a, a critical uh, thinking and, and conversations. If someone in your group says, this is how it is, then that gets repeated two, three times, then that all of, all of a sudden becomes uh, truth. How do you see that? I completely agree with you. And I think it's incredibly dangerous for our university. I think it's incredibly dangerous for our schools. So what to do? I think first you have to identify the problem and hold up a mirror. And, and holding up a mirror, just convincing people first that they don't always know right from wrong is, is a big step because there is so much anger and certainty in today's debate and there's so little listening and there's so little learning. The second thing is helping but, establish but, some trust for a conversation. Juan, is technology at fault for this or are there other societal forces that are, uh, are, are impeding our ability to, uh, to express our, our democratic ways? We have so many smart people in technology and ethics on this. That is a debate all of us should be having, right? This is something that we've got to get a brain trust that looks like this brain trust right on this call to have that conversation as to how do we, how do we begin to restitch civility? And, so and how do we question, think about technology? Uh, Pat, do you have a question on the environment now uh, or does someone else want to jump in? I have a question with regards to nude sources. The people I know that are really on opposite ends of the spectrum are getting the, a lot of fake news and that's where they believe their credible news comes from and it isn't. I say to them often, are you... Frozen. Did we lose? It was old New York buildings. Hey, John. Yep. You're just believing everything you read on Facebook in a world where every single one of our feeds is different. So we lost a, a Laura, portion. we lost the middle part. Is it about fake news? It's about every single one of our feeds is different. Yes. And the people I know that are on opposite ends of the extreme are in these rabbit holes and don't understand how to, they're not the smart people on this call. They don't know how to understand the concept of a credible source. Plenty of smart people make mistakes, I want to point out, but yeah. Juan? Well, we have just a few media experts on this call. How, how do we restitch a common conversation on civility and some quality control across, and do we want quality control across information? How, how, how do you structure I mean, this is, this is a absolutely critical conversation when so many countries in the world are splitting, right? You've got the Basques and the Welsh and the Catalans and everybody else. User-generated companies of content. Do you wanna weigh in here or you pass? Oh, look, I, I, I mean, this is a super interesting conversation. I, I, a few thoughts come to mind. One of which is just, I think there's a, to the last question about, there's a sort of a, pre and post diluvian uh, paradigm, right? People who have grown up in a connected world or online or digital natives, right? Are very used to getting sources of information that is completely different than those who didn't have it beforehand. Um, the ability to influence millions of people and not even being a famous person, but just have that kind of power to very quickly be able to influence people um, on surface things without a face-to-face -face conversation is an incredible power, right? That I don't think has, Juan, you mentioned, has been unleashed before in society. Um, and, you know, back to the point on the media, like the, I think, you know, blowing up the fairness doctrine and then you sort of have Facebook or, you know, in, Instagram that is really not regulated, um, creates all these different silos. So there's a whole, confl I think there's a whole conflagration of elements that, that lead to this polarization and allow people to be, Juan, to your point, very um, 
dismissive of others without having to be able to stand the test in a public square face to face or have one to one interactions to be able to convince others. And I think that paradigm shift to me creates a lot of these, a lot of these issues you're talking about. So Kat, why don't you ask an environmental question? Matt's invented uh, Chipotle and in trying to fix capitalism. I bet you have a question. And then does anyone else want to jump in? So Kat, go. And, and I know Juan came back from Greenland, really moved about looking at ice cores. And he's worried that we're, we're screwed. <laughs> More on that one. Just, just breathing through that uh, tee up. Thanks, John. Deep time, um, the planet is changing so rapidly. Uh, indigenous elders tell us we have less than a decade. How do we make sufficient moral and ethical evolutions and time to achieve what we need to in order to survive in a rapidly changing earth? So look, first, I think we have to change the question. The question is not how do we reduce climate change? I think the question is now, how do we reduce the average temperature of the planet by at least one degree? Right? Because if you don't actually achieve that, if you keep working at stuff on the margin, I think we're in deep trouble. And I think MIT and other places are leading in that. And we have to push it hard, fast. I can tell you, I, I'm, in, I'm in Georgia. They don't even have recycling bins down here now. So <laughs> we got a long way to go. <laughs> yeah. I, I do, what gives me hope is the cost curves on alternatives are dropping so quick that like meats, it's gonna be absolutely irrational to use coal pretty soon. And most people will not mm. use oil for most things very soon. But we have to be able to bridge until those cost curves cross. Mm. And, and then people are going to look at us like we look at people who use whale oil to light their houses. We're, mm -hmm. we're going to seem so criminally irresponsible. Hey, Gary, I know um, you run the Socrates program that thinks about big issues. wonder if you have any thoughts. Um, uh, Max, did you want to jump in? I know you're trying to fix capitalism. Uh, I'm not trying to. I, I just want to thank you, Juan. I think it's a I think mm -hmm. the unfortunately we all I think the biggest problem in our culture is that uh, responsibility is ever always a question of somebody else's responsibility. I think the only way to fix our problems is to have more conversations like these that are more decent, more open, more curious, more human, more forgiving, maybe more humble one. Uh, so the only question I have really is to how do we shift the public discourse? in this direction because it has become, I think climate change is a real problem, but our cultural climate change might be even worse uh, because we can't talk to each other in a decent way. And it's really the, the barrier across all institutions. So I love the contribution you're making, Juan. I always like that uh, whatever we can do to help each other, to have more of these conversations and turn off the news, meet with people, talk to people, like the Weaver project that David Brooks started is really good, grounds up. There's just no other way. Uh, we have to stop believing that some other person will fix our problems. I, I subscribe to the Jerry Garcia theory, which is somebody's got to do something. And it's just incredibly pathetic that it has to be us. Uh, let's see, Gary, do you have a question? And then I want to, if anyone wants to jump in after Gary. Uh, no, I, I didn't have a question, question uh, but do you, since you uh, asked me about Socrates, it, it, the Socrates Society program at the Aspen Institute is a good venue to engage in this kind of thoughtful debate about ethics and related topics, um, and it's open to anybody. It um, happens uh, typically over President's Day weekend and, um, uh, and July 4th uh, weekend or nearby. Um, Historically, it's been in person. Lately, it's virtual, and uh, um, it's. Uh, I think many of you would enjoy it. Phil Clay, do you have anything you want to say? I see your your screen is uh, dark. I don't know if you're still there. Uh, anyone else want to jump in? Robert Green, you're a biologist. Genetics, I feel like, is going to be a big big deal in the future. Yeah, I often think in terms of incentives, and I was just sitting here wondering what sort of, there are plenty of incentives to divide and Juan's book has alluded to a lot of them. 
you know, you can get fame for being inflammatory on TV. You can get money. Um, and there's disincentives to, to trying to be reasonable and, and respect the other, respect the opinion of the other. There's disincentives. We have a, that a reservation what, here. Can we park? When they come what, what are the friends? possible ways we could create uh, incentives no, for dinner. people that Yeah, would, it is um, 18 for the night. They would, oh, they would actually you know, help complimentary come, parking uh, for dinner. either be uh, rewarded no, or recognized or for crossing okay. over the bridge. Sorry, guys. That's the answer. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, I don't know if that came through. Yes. You know, it's especially important and fraught in your area and Georgia's area. Right, because you and George are at the forefront of trying to educate people in the rapidly shifting ethics of genetics. And and what you know, people thought IVF or birth control or frozen embryos was an abomination not that long ago. And as you create new things, as you talk about new things, boy, have the slings and arrows come your way. And and you know, stuff which people are accusing you of may turn out to be absolutely normal and natural in X time. So I hear your, I hear your plea and I hear your pain and it drives me crazy that when I read something that has been sensationalized that George said, that there isn't a debate about it as opposed to accusations and harangues against it. I don't, I don't know if he's right or wrong. Let's talk about it. Right. Francesco, um, you're a postdoc. I hear, I feel like we've heard from a lot of old people. What do you think as a younger person? And then going back to old people, Richard Saul Werman, you always have an opinion on everything. <laughs> yeah, so well, what I think is that the power of those images that uh, you know, Ivan, Ivan, like showed us is uh, incredible in understanding that we always need to go beyond the surface, beyond how things look like. Uh, and uh, I think there are some things that are uh, obviously like that, like and it's easy to make the connection and the message came across very well. But I think there's so many other things that really depend on education. So I think the point that I, that I, that I like from my perspective, I think educating people on getting to know more about this so that they can more evaluate more critically this information and what they are exposed would be absolutely, is, is absolutely, mandatory and a priority so that's uh that's where like one of the messages that i got from this talk and thank you so much for for everything in the conversation Janet, you're a world-class artist jenny rowe you're a world-class person do you guys have any questions <laughs> yeah actually i actually have a couple it, comments oh wait, wait, let's have janet go first yeah uh, my question is how to amplify this because we are we're living in a moment where complex conversations are very quick to be shut down. And the nuance uh, and humility of talking about difficult gray space, uh, I, I'm finding it challenging to find places for that. So I'd love any suggestions to amplify this conversation that Juan has, has begun. Juan, do you have an answer to that? Or do we go to Jenny Rowe? No, I love people feeding into this as opposed to asking questions. Cause I, I want to learn more about this stuff, right? Yeah. Your book's like a wiki. Jenny Rowe, what do you got? So I understand the technology influences ethics. And for me, the access to technology is never going to be equalized everywhere we go. So to change a uh, difference in ethics will be always there, but what are the elements of ethics that actually haven't changed over time that we can actually connect with each other uh, without starting the conversation from two different sides of right or wrong. There must be something that we are on the same page that is right and right. It's surprising how often that changes, right? So, so often people come to me and say, look, there are absolutes in ethics and they're written in stone. So if you take, for some people, one of the core, core commandments, thou shall not kill. That does not have an asterisk on it that says thou shall not kill unless if the person is your enemy, unless if the person's trying to kill you, 
unless if you are part of an army and then it's a just killing, unless if you are executing somebody, unless if you are defending your child. There is no give on that, right? And, and so the, the nuance as to how we've interpreted that commandment over time actually gives me great hope. I'm an optimistic curmudgeon because we have started to take violence seriously. And we've started to reduce violence on the whole. And that's been a trend across Do, generations. And Mike, you've been to six Olympics as a Paralympian. You know, the whole world comes together. What do you think? Heinz, you run a family office or a bunch of family office leaders on this call, you know, in centimillionaires, post-economic. What should they be doing? Uh, Moran Surf, you're a brilliant thinker. Do you have any thoughts? Steve Patterson, you're a pretty cantankerous journalist. What do you think you write about technology? All right, Mike, go. I just like the, um, the emphasis on community and conversation. One of the things that's very memorable for me is uh, being at the Paralympics and in, in the athletes village, you have uh, people from all over the world with a variety of disabilities, missing limbs, uh, visual impairments, everything. And the conversations and the community that's, that takes place within that, that, um, that two weeks at the Paralympics is, is profound. And uh, I just think it's figuring out how to keep the momentum going. So thank you for sharing, Juan. Erica, you're in Japan. Uh, Javier, you're in Argentina. Anything you want to share before Moran shares? So John, this is Heinz. Happy yeah. to jump in here. I put a um, target on your back by saying you run a family office. <laughs> um, so Juan, always enjoyed your comments and loved your book, by the way, Evolving Ourselves. That, that was a wonderful book. Um, wanted to ask you about today's time. So we're in COVID right now and um, we're learning how to use technology sort of a substitute for in-person communication. And The Economist last week had a wonderful article about how wonderful in the sense it was very lucid, elucidating, um, um, an article about how COVID has hurt democracies because even governments are using COVID now as an excuse to suppress mobility. And I'm just wondering in these COVID times, um, do you think that expressing right and wrong is becoming more difficult because we can't move around as much? We don't see how other people live as much because we're kind of isolated to our homes or to our workplaces. What do you think, how has COVID impacted uh, this debate? I don't have a good answer for you. You know, on the one hand, we're more and more medieval cities where we're only allowing those absolutely closest to us inside the walls. So it's a collapse of of nationhood. On the other hand, there are so many people hurting that if we don't understand they're hurting, they're gonna burn the system down. Right. I mean, there are just so many people out there who are hurting and God help us if we don't have compassion. Moran, you're doing a lot of brain computer interface stuff. Like, are you thinking about ethics or are you just like hooking uh, wires up to the brain? So I think that the, if I were to give a talk anywhere about the brain in the last three years, no matter what I speak about, there's always the same three questions that come up at the end, uh, regardless of the topic. And one of them is about difference between men and women. One is about drugs, asking for a friend. And the third one is about ethics. And it suggests to me that people care about it. So I have a prepared statement that I give and I kind of, but I think that all I say is exactly what this question said, which is, I can give you my personal opinion as a person and as a scientist, I kind of, I'm a citizen. So I, I can tell you what the science shows. I can tell you what the uh, trajectory that it's going to, but I don't uh, decide. I think that my, my job is to make it accessible to you so you'd know what to vote on, but that's where you become relevant. And I think this is what I am hoping for, for from a saying like this. So, um... Uh, we have the world champion accordionist ready to go. Juan, did you have a closing point you wanted to make? I did have a question too, but 
don't know if you wanted to answer that. And, and John, can I make just a quick comment? Yeah, um, yeah. Anna, yeah. Thank you. Um, I feel like this space we're in right now with the pandemic and it's created a, um, a space and time where many things have come to a head that we've been able to deny for a long time. Um, crisis with healthcare, education, race, all of these things were there already under the surface. So it was easier for us to pretend that they weren't there. So I think one of the gifts of this space is that we're being confronted in a way that we have to address some issues now. So I completely agree, but we're also creating the instruments to be able to address them. Hey, Mike, you just wrote about shock jocks. Can you can you say that to the group? I think that's interesting before Juan does his closing comment. I was just going to say I was uh, echoing what I think Heinz was saying or someone that maybe it was Robert Green that disincentive might be very important because in media, you have some of the highest paid people are the most divisive um, and have the most airtime. So we've got to counteract that somehow. Um, and so what is the incentive to have positive programming that's un that's unifying I think that's should send them one book i don't think that's going to do it all right any uh, other last want, 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 uh, want, uh, can i say something just quickly uh so so i, I worked for the new york state uh, uh court system for for decades and decades and uh uh i uh, retired from the system uh last year but I'm very closely connected and follow it. And uh, last week, uh, a report was issued on racism in the New York State court system. I mean, this is one of the largest court systems in the country. And, uh, and they made various and sundry recommendations in terms of uh, uh, bias, anti-bias training. And, uh, and it, it, it's, it's a long and, and rather detailed report. Uh, I, I always am concerned uh, in terms of that he without sin cast the first stone. It, it's very complicated, I think, to address some of these issues. I mean, this is after all a justice system where you would expect that there would not be a racism, bias, discrimination. And it's certainly important that it look at itself and focus on these issues. But in terms of the ethics of, of, a, of a large organization such as this, how to address these problems uh, can be confounding and particularly confounding when resources are so limited, when uh, $300 million has just been eliminated from this court system's budget, the state is in crisis with regard to its own uh, funding. And uh, I, I really wonder how in these large institutions, public institutions, universities, we can uh, uh, project discussions such as the one that we had tonight. And actually, Juan, I'd like to send that report to you. I know you have too much to read, but, but I'll, I'll make sure you get it. Juan great. originally went into government. He was the chief of staff and the president of a big uh, operation in Mexico. So he knows a little bit about government, uh, but it's not, it's not uh, up, is it up to date? What do you think of uh, my dad's question? <laughs> I, I think it's, exactly the right question right because it's we've we've lost contact in democracy and we've lost contact with one another we've lost our civility towards one another we, we think it's okay to call you, you know we've forgotten what it's like to have thanksgiving and have a discussion that's civil with people who we care about because we've been so isolated by this stuff and we've we've forgotten but on the court system, the one thing I'd say to you is, would you rather be tried by today's court system or a court system in the 1960s or a court system in the 1900s or a court system in the 1850s? And horrible as life is today and frustrated and angry as we are, the previous generations have helped make this better. And boy, we better make it better. And, and the way to make it better is to bring each other along, not to try and destroy each other. John, can I ask you a quick question to David? David's a 3D animator of uh, medical stuff and brilliant, very creative. Thank you. 
Uh, real quick question, you know, you talk about 48% of, uh, of the wealth is held by, by 1% uh, who are insulating themselves more and more from the rest of us. How do we dissociate their, their isolation from the idea that their first class cabins are firmly welded to the ship they're trying to sink? <laughs> You know, I think there's a very strange coalition that's possible between people on the left and people who are Trump voters against that structure. Because one of the things technology has done is it's enabled you to concentrate and build wealth like we have never done before with very few people. And, and again, it's not an issue of scarcity, it's an issue of distribution. We have to have a rational discussion about distribution. We have to have a rational discussion as to it is not okay to leave people in the street. It is not okay for people to lose their lives because they can't afford diabetes medication. No. We, we, if we didn't have enough, it still wouldn't be okay, but it'd be a different debate. We're gonna be judged because we had enough and we didn't. Yeah. So uh, Mike, you got the accordion? Go Mike. What? Or. <laughs> Or Corey. John, I, well, so, Corey, do you have the accordion? I, 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 I do. I just wanted to uh, say to Juan, um, th this was really phenomenal, uh, especially for me, because I'm a centrist. So it, it's which is becoming, I feel like, extinct at this point because you got to be on one side or the other. But I mean, I'd say it was more of a Democrat. But uh, 20 years ago uh, when I was performing as a kid at the Clinton White House. But that's become more of a centrist today. But it, it's scary for me in my profession, because music today uh, and the entertainment industry as a whole has become extremely, extremely far left, and it has become pretty much encouraged to every level uh, that your social and political beliefs are far more important than how good you are at your craft and, and what you actually do. And as someone who spent his life to become the best in the world at what I do and always trying to further that, it's almost been rendered meaningless uh, and I think that is a severely dangerous situation to lose the hierarchy and the meritocracy in, in anything in civilization. So with <laughs> the meritocracy of, in my case, being a musician and other skills in the entertainment industry and really other industries as well, being replaced more by the ideology than anything else, um, you know, it, it's extremely scary. And at, at what point do you think it hits a, an event horizon where we go back to actually worrying about <laughs> the actual skill level versus what is your, you know, feeling on this topic or that topic? Yes, that is a topic all of us could spend all night on, and it's an important topic. Um, because so many places are gated by, you know, are you a part of an ever-shrinking tribe as opposed to other questions? And, and the tribe is described as tighter and tighter. And, you know, going back to Voltaire, those who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. And sometimes it's the people who are seeking the just reforms that end up manning the guillotines. And the guillotines turn on those who are seeking those just reforms. So it's a dangerous place in a society when you have too many of the righteous on any part of the spectrum. Um, look, so if any of you want to host one of these conversations, I've got a lot of time to have these conversations. So just email me, let me know, and I'm, I'm happy to talk to people about this. And if you want to host them, please go and host them. Host, you don't have to use my book, right? But, but just ask people a question. What are we doing today? that may be considered profoundly wrong tomorrow. And in that context, how do you judge the past? And how do you judge people who may disagree with you? And how and do you isolate the evil? I was like in college, I see Sam Perry and Allison Sanders are here. Katie Barrell, great to see you joining us also. Uh, so Corey, take us away from Rhode Island. Is, is there anything specific you want to hear, John? You know, <laughs> no, no, you, you, uh, uh, musician's choice. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll do a mix of, of things here.
Phil later. I remember Linda, you I think you're a theologian by training. Do you have anything to add to this conversation? And John Hawthorne, as as the one of the godfathers of startups, do you have anything to add to this conversation? Um, I will uh, happily say a few words, but I'm not a theologian. Um, it it uh, pains me that we have gotten less and less civil. I started to do a doctorate talking about uh, respectful dialogue back in, oh, it's been almost 10 years. And I realized there's no constituency. Um, we would love to have TV programs and conversations where we could discuss issues, but we're preaching to the choir here is what I think. And um, my question to you, you don't have to answer it now on, but I'm gonna email you is, what about those conversations with your neighbors? I mean, to me, that's, I mean, maybe they're all very woke and progressive, but I kind of suspect they have different views than you. And, you know, it's hard to do. We say we should do it, but it's hard to do it. And um, I think there's going to have to be grassroots efforts. And But I love what you said. The trench warfare thing was the most helpful thing. And one last thing. We believe, all of us, we don't always talk about it, in the value of stories. I mean, George Floyd's horrific murder galvanized this nation. It, a speech wouldn't have done it, uh, moralizing wouldn't have done it, and the book wouldn't have done it. So, you know, where are those stories and how can we live out those stories? Because that's what changes people. Ambassador Later, you were ambassador to uh, the Court of St. James, I believe, and I think you're the chairman of... Uh... Uh, Morgan Stanley or so, something huge. What, what do you what do you have to say? Well, you're very good at promoting people. I commend you on that. <laughs> I would hasten to say, um, Juan, I remember very vividly a, a distinctive conversation we had on this very subject. And your book is at the top of our stack, but I must confess I haven't read it yet. I look I'm forward. reading it. That's the reason I haven't read it yet. <laughs> um, but the thing I still, I still struggle with and I know there's a challenge for you, is how do we exercise the restraint and the humility and offer the dignity in opinions to those who believe that there are some questions that are normative in the range of morality and ethics and who recognize and are adept at embracing technology but still recognize in their view the reasons for having normalistic views towards certain issues. How do we engage those people, which may be some of us here, uh, in conversations of that sort? Well, I've spent oh, a lot of time Elio. talking about evolution in some of the most conservative universities in the US. I have never been disrespected. I've never been treated in a manner that I wouldn't want to be treated. And what you've got to do first is You've got to read what people are reading and start with that and say, look, I understand you believe X, Y, and Z. And let me tell you, I believe something different and I want you to see the world from my perspective. And then I want to have a conversation between what you think and what I think. And the way I engage my neighbors in Maine is I spend 90% of my time listening. I don't go in and try and convince, I try and understand and then I repeat back what I heard, and then I try and find common ground on it. I, I'm not a teacher when I go and talk to my neighbors. That doesn't work. Yeah. So John Hawthorne, I'm about to call on you. Khalil, are you there? And Allison Sanders, are you there? Or are these fake uh, cards that you're putting up? John, we should probably cut this because people are probably No, I know they're we, they're, we they're, they're, an hour. they're going off. We, we just got three more and then then I'll let okay. people I, I am here, but I'll say that my question, some, some amount of my question has already been asked, so I'll uh, pass on to somebody else. 
no, 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 Khalil, you you represent the millennials or Gen Z, and you're going to run for president of a Caribbean <laughs> island. We need to know what you think. <laughs> No, I, this has been a great discussion and very timely, obviously. And I, I did have a question for Juan, which is if you know you could change one thing right now in the way technology is used in opposition to some of the more nefarious ways in which it's being used, misinformation campaigns, propaganda campaigns, you know, deep fakes. What is the one thing that you would change right now using technology? I would like far more transparency on who's speaking, right? I, I think the blue check mark thing, you go and say whatever you want, insult whoever you want, but put your name behind it and tell people who you are. Because um, I think the, the, we, we have to eliminate the deep fakes, we have to eliminate the robots and, and we have to have clearer voices and then I would love all of us to boost the middle as opposed to boosting the extremes and, and boosting the outrage. It's, it's so easy to push the endorphins on fear um, and those rip communities apart because you start to fear everybody. Yeah, so Allison and then John Hawthorne, you're the last one and Juan, I don't feel bad. I am excited for people to hear different perspectives and people are leaving on their own. Uh, so these will be the last two. Allison, are you there? Okay, so John Hawthorne, you uh, run the largest, uh, or you started the largest incubator for startups. What's your perspective on this? And uh, have you gained any insight and ask Juan a tough question? So this is great, I appreciate it. I, I'll, I'll ask the toughest question of all as the entrepreneur. Uh, I'm always interested in what, what do I do and how do I change things and have a massive impact, not just take a single action, I'm, I'm actually physically in Maine right now. And I know that I see all of the Trump signs, all my neighbors, I'm in that same population and crowd. And so I, ha I can have the small dialogue, I can, ha I can listen, I can learn, and that does help a lot. Um, but what can I do that contributes to a more meaningful, peaceful dialogue and exchange at scale? It, you know, so much of it, it's just seeing the other. I, I think of uh, people like Norman Lear and just how much of an impact he had on society by showing people who were different and bringing them into living rooms. I think how important it was to have some of the early shows on people who were gay. I think how important it is to have people who are thinking different from us and and exposing it and, and people will recognize decency and authenticity. I mean, you're seeing it with Tony Fauci, right? People, people will recognize decency and authenticity. And if you're, your neighbors in Maine will not disrespect you if you tell them I disagree with you, if you respect them. But if you tell them you're a dumb shit and I'm here from Harvard and I'm here to tell you the truth, then you're in big trouble. And, and that comes back to the humility and forgiveness of people, right? I mean, you, you gotta believe things are gonna get better. You gotta believe 98% of people are decent human beings and you gotta believe we're trying to do okay. Um, and if we don't work as a community, we're just not gonna solve the climate change issue and we're not gonna solve the de divisiveness issue. And, and we really are gonna untie the United States and many other countries. So listen more, talk to people more, try and get people in the room who don't agree with you. And let's try and help each other find better answers and inch our way towards a better right. Great, so that'll be the last word. Corey, if you could just play something, if anyone wants to reach out to anyone that was on this um, Zoom, uh, feel free to email me and I'll, I'll give you their, uh, I'll connect you. And then if you want to be enlightened uh, by reading this book, you can uh, purchase it. Uh, it's small. It, it could fit in your, uh, uh, you know, it's very, uh, it's good exercise and it's, uh, it'll expand your brain and it'll help you have dialogue to make the world a better place. Uh, I don't get a cut if you buy it, uh, but I will sleep better knowing that more people are aware of the, these ideas. And Juan, thank you for putting them down on paper. And this is the beginning. Juan wants all of you to contribute ideas. Uh, so uh, thank you for uh, being here tonight. 
Thank you, Juan. Oh, <laughs> thank you all very much. Thank, thank you. Bye. Right, Corey, play something as people leave. Thank you. people know um, we'll meet again. <laughs> Somewhat appropriate for this one. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Right. Great to see you, Juan. Thank you so much. Looking thank forward you to so reading much. the book. Thank I you, just Daniel. ordered it. <laughs> well, thank you, John and Juan. This was an amazing, amazing. Oh, so, thank you, John. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all very much. <laughs> thank you, Juan. Good night. Good night. Fabulous. Thanks, Mom. Thank Love you. Love the book. <laughs> Thank you.